Hey, adventurous souls! Ready to dive into the fantastical world of Gretchen's misadventures? You're in for a treat! Welcome back to my channel, your haven for all things magical. Today, we're cracking open Of Hair and No Hair, Episode 2 in the Spellbinding series by P.A. Mason. In this whimsical tale, join us as we follow Gretchen on yet another misadventure, where magical mishaps and peculiar produce await. So grab your map, a sprinkle of curiosity, and let's unravel the enchantment of of hair and no hair. Chapter 1 She's lying. Spittle flew from Ewan's mouth. She promised that vile concoction would have my hair grown back in no time. He waggled a finger over the guard's shoulder and Gretchen guffawed. Your hair grew back, buddy. You never specified where you wanted it. Enough. The guard held up his hands in the close confines of the narrow alleyway. This is a matter for the magistrate. Move along. Tell that dreadful hag to give me my money back before I talk to the sheriff about this. Ewan scratched at a tuft of hair poking through his collar, and Gretchen smothered a giggle. You brought a hair potion off the shelf for a couple of coins. You want to be a cheapskate with beauty products? After accusing me of fleecing you when I offered to brew something specific, you deserve all the unwanted hair you get. Aha! Uh -huh. Ewan clapped his hands. You heard that, didn't you? I'll be calling you as a witness to that confession. She'll be chased out of this city once I'm through with her. Ewan spun on his heel to march to the market square. The guard turned to Gretchen, his leathery face creased in a toothy grin. It's all anyone's been talking about for weeks. He's the laughingstock of the marketplace. The guard clapped her on the shoulder. Couldn't have happened to a nicer guy. Gretchen snickered and pulled a vial from her pouch. Time to make amends, I guess. She sidled past the guard to her stall and stood on her soapbox to get a better vantage of the crowd. Listen up, folks. She held the bottle aloft, which sparkled golden in the afternoon sun. Today's special offer is my famous de-hair potion. Tired of all that back hair? Bikini line chafing? This is the solution you've all been waiting for, all for a low price of three silver coins. A few people stopped to stare, one guy scratching his rear end. She glimpsed Ewan's glossy scalp as he stormed over and she coughed to hide a smirk. You'll never see a price like this again, and I have one dose left, with ingredients from the far-flung reaches of the realm, some only available a few months a year. It will be some time before I can prepare another batch. Ewan elbowed past the onlookers and snatched the bottle from Gretchen's hand. Hey, you plan on paying for that? Gretchen put her hands on her hips and glared. Just taking what I'm owed. Ewan glowered at the bystanders and turned his nose in the air as he marched off. The crowd dispersed with animated whispers, and Gretchen dusted off her hands, whistling as she packed up her stall. What was that all about? The guard leaned against an adjoining booth with a twinkle in his eye. Ah. Gretchen tapped her nose and winked. Wait until you see what happens to his eyebrows. Poetic justice. The guard shook his head and chuckled. Going so early? With the jars out of the way, Gretchen folded the cleverly designed bamboo stall into a long bundle of sticks and tied it together with the cloth that served as shade over the top. Yup, won't be here tomorrow neither. Tomorrow's the big day. Pumpkin growing competition in the next village over. She held up her untied pouch and bit her lip as she pushed the bamboo through the impossibly small space. Shame I can't get my pumpkins into the pouch. It'll be a wagon and donkey farting in my direction all morning. The guard watched in fascination as she arranged her things inside the infinity pouch. I still don't understand how that thing works. Truth be told, neither do I. All I know is, it was the best investment I ever made, even if it did involve a wizard. Gretchen tied the pouch strings to her belt and leaned her broom's handle over her shoulder. She had her entire inventory stowed away and wasn't a pound heavier. Doing business in the city each day was out of the question without it. Well, it's probably best if you aren't around tomorrow, anyhow. Ewan doesn't let things go easily. Thanks, Bill. I know you've got my back. She clapped his shoulder as she walked past him into the laneway toward the stables. There was a strip around the back she used to take to the air without having to walk all the way out of the city walls which was worth it, even if she got crap on her boots. Ewan would be a problem. She knew she shouldn't have ticked him off, 
but couldn't help herself after the holier-than-thou attitude he'd spewed when she'd first set up in the city. The other traders were mostly friendly. There wasn't much direct competition. And Gretchen had felt at home a few weeks after she'd started her little enterprise in the big smoke. As she passed through the stables, she tipped her hat to the lad who took care of the animals during the afternoons. On the sly, she pulled a hunk of bread out of her pocket to slip to her favourite mare, who already had her head hanging out of the stall. She was her favourite because she had spunk, and if she didn't hand over something, the mare was quick to take a swipe at her pointed hat. Around the back, she was pleased to see the ground had dried throughout the morning, and it boded well for the fly home. It was a longer commute than the marketplace back home, but her aversion to flying was limited to taking off and landing. She usually managed well enough once she got airborne. Rolling her shoulders twice and dropping into half a dozen squats, she shook the tension from her limbs to psych herself up. She wouldn't make an ass of herself in front of the kids shoveling dung into the middens, or land face first in the middens either. Positive thinking would give her wings. With a deep breath, she pumped her legs on the spot and launched down the track to spring into the air. The kids had plucked up some courage, though, and a poop projectile narrowly missed her head as she swung the broom under her rump. She made a face at them as she swooped by and decided on a prank of her own when she next landed. A tonic of stench would hardly make a difference in that yard, but conjuring an itch cloud might do nicely. Turning her attention upward, she pivoted the broom in time to miss the walls and snapped her mouth shut against wind-borne insects in her path. Once clear of the city and the perilous plumes of smoke from the outlying buildings that housed the more unsavoury industries, she relaxed in a comfortable thermal. From there on out, it was a matter of keeping the broom pointed in the right direction and avoiding the occasional duck. She was looking forward to tomorrow's venture at the county fair and thought her crop of pumpkins stood a good chance of snagging a ribbon. With Nora officiating the competition, she'd made it crystal clear that magic was prohibited. But with the wood nymphs giving her garden a helping hand at a working bee at her cottage, she could solemnly swear her magic played no part in its impressive girth. The skies ahead of her looked blue as far as she could see, and she smelled no hint of moisture in the air. She hoped fair weather would follow her travels, and that after showing off her green thumb, she'd have enough time to taste-test every barrel of ale brought in by hopeful brewers. The fair was one of the few events in the year which Gretchen looked forward to, and for the first time in years, she had the means to enjoy herself. If not for guarding her pumpkins against sabotage from vindictive types, she'd have likely booked a room at a well-to-do tavern. Well, maybe not all that fancy. When the fields below, arranged into a familiar pattern of brilliant yellow canola, butted against leafy green lucerne, she edged slowly downward. Ahead was the edge of dense forest close to her cottage, a dwelling off the beaten track, which was just as she liked it. She dipped into lower wind drifts, more frequented by smaller birds, and turned circles around her freshly thatched roof. As she nosedived to land, she muttered a prayer to whatever passing deity might heed her and screwed her eyes shut. Her boots brushed past leaves in the trees and dragged enough to veer the broom. Her eyes snapped open just in time to register her roof as the likely impact zone. She squeaked and rolled from the errant broom onto the thatch with a thump that knocked the wind from her lungs. Yoo-hoo! Everything okay up there? Gretchen cringed and rolled on her back to stare up at the sky. What was Nora doing here? She sucked in a few deep breaths and sat up. I'm fine, just checking the thatch is all. Seems to be holding up well. She unsnagged her dress from the hardened reeds and shuffled down toward her garden. Sure, Nora scoffed. I'm starting to see why it needed repairing in the first place. Gretchen climbed down the accommodating lattice on the north side of her house, mindful not to damage the cappy vine on the way down. When her boots hit the ground, she turned to frown at Nora sitting on her favourite garden bench. And what are you doing here then? Isn't it against the fair's rules or something? She couldn't help the smug smile as she cast her eye over her fat crop basking in the afternoon sun. Hardly. Nora slapped her knee and stood to circle the largest pumpkin, which was a good deal bigger than the rest. Not when I'd wager Mildred's harvest is plumper than this lot. You know, she took hers off the vine last week. Didn't want to risk it spoiling. Gretchen's lip curled at the mention of Mildred. 
snooty green thumb she was. Gives her the perfect excuse when she doesn't win this year. Gretchen sniffed. It's about time someone knocked that woman down a peg or two. Oh, come now, Nora snorted. Don't get your knickers in a twist. Let's go have some tea. Gretchen bit back a reply and followed Nora inside, glaring at her broom, which dangled from a tree by the window. So what are you doing here, anyhow? Gretchen scraped her boots on the way in and prodded the fire back to life before putting the kettle on. Just passing through, thought I'd stop in before making my way to Oakdale. There's a special dinner for the judges tonight before things kick off in the morning. Gretchen filled her teapot and gave an appreciative murmur. Her cottage wasn't on the way to Oakdale from the Baron's estate, but she'd bet money on Nora coming from the Sultan Bog, which was her usual haunt. So how do you plan on getting that pumpkin to the fair? I don't suppose it would fit in that pouch of yours. Gretchen slid the tea tray onto the kitchen table and fixed Nora with a level stare. On account of the confidentiality agreement she signed, she couldn't tell her friend how she'd gotten the means to buy the infinity pouch, so she'd made up some story about inheriting it. Nora didn't believe a word of it. Jürgen will be by in the morning with a cart, as I'm sure you're aware. Nora cleared her throat as she poured for both and planted a warm smile on her face. Oh, I think he did say something about that last week. It's been a while since I stopped in at the tavern. Gretchen quirked an eyebrow as she took a sip of tea. With her new enterprise, she was more inclined to stop by in the mornings to share a cup of coffee with the troll than to fritter away afternoons drinking ale. There were only so many hours in the day and she had to keep her inventory stocked to keep up in the city. But there were several occasions where she tiptoed past a snoring Nora in the taproom to sit with Jürgen in the kitchen. So how are the preparations coming along? I'm sure the Baron's household is in a flap. His lordship has really gotten himself into a pickle this year, was running his mouth in the city, and has agreed to host some fancy party at the estate to pay homage to the year's bounty. Nora's lip curled as she stirred sugar into her cup. So not only is everyone trying to organise a county fair, they're preparing for the gentry to arrive. Poor souls won't have any time to enjoy the festivities. Would serve him right if his sheets are itchy and meals are bland for a few months. Gretchen let out a low whistle. Well, I can't say I'd blame them, and I'm guessing you're off the hook. He hardly has any need of hexes during a grand soiree. She waved her hand. That'll come after, once they've traded insults over one too many brandies. Gretchen smirked. Nora had been in the Baron's employ for a few years. If she wasn't careful, he'd have nobody left to curse soon. But enough of that. Nora took a last gulp of tea and set her cup back on the tray. I must make a move if I want to miss the birds flitting around at dusk. Gretchen saw her out and waved as she took off neatly from her garden and into the air. She scowled at her own broom before trotting over to her pumpkin patch, where she gave the big guy a knock, her ear pressed to its side to check the sound. Not as plump as Mildred's, eh? Well, she could do something about that. Chapter 2. Discreet, I said. She thumped her desk beside the spell book and the letters on the page jittered. Nora can't suspect anything. The words on the page swirled and the letters rearranged themselves. Gretchen squinted at the page and rubbed her chin. That could work. Committing the spell to memory, she slammed the book shut before returning it to her stash spot underneath the floorboards. She tottered to the kitchen and unlocked her reinforced pantry door. As it swung open, a flurry of activity scuttled across the floor as light reached the darkened corners, and Gretchen stamped her foot for good measure. You can count yourselves lucky I haven't had time to cook up some poison. If I could trust Mulligan to keep his nose out of the jerky, you'd all be cat treats by now. She shuffled in under bundles of dried herbs hanging from the low ceiling and followed her nose to the right ingredients. The small cupboard was getting crowded, and if things kept looking up, she'd need to think seriously about having a cellar dug out the back to house her growing collection. Rounding up a few stoppered jars and sprigs from various bundles, she climbed out of the pantry and held back a sneeze. Mulligan's scruffy head poked around the corner, and Gretchen held a finger up in warning. No, you don't, Fleabag. I've got things just as I like them in there, and I won't have you trashing it. Mulligan glared and dropped to his haunches, 
as Gretchen emptied her hands and locked up behind her. Never you mind. I stopped by the butchers today for those gizzards you like. She untied her pouch and reached in shoulder deep to retrieve the waxed paper package. Mulligan's nose twitched and he scampered to his dish as she bent to empty the stinking contents into it. Now. She set the paper aside and held hands to her hips. A quick brew before dinner and a good night's sleep before Jürgen gets here. Plumper indeed. The only thing Mildred has that's plumper than mine is her rear end. Gretchen chortled as she crumbled herbs and seeds into her mortar and a scant few drops from the bottles. From the doses prescribed, she'd likely have a lot left over, but she could think of a few customers who would jump at the chance to make some of their appendages bigger, if only for a few hours. She pounded the mixture into a thick paste, all the while muttering incantations with half-lidded eyes. The recipe called for a moderate amount of heat, so Gretchen fetched down one of her smallest cauldrons and added just a little boiled water from the kettle. After stirring in the mixture, she hung it on the far side of the hearth to warm slowly and refilled the kettle to lie in wait with a cup of tea. When she sat herself in front of the fire to keep her eye on the brew, a thump on the door almost ended with a lap full of scorching liquid. She set the cup on the mantel with a grumble and reefed the door open with a glare. A young woman, gentry by the look of her tailored dress, stood on her porch with a satin scarf wrapped around her head. Gretchen blinked and shook her head, but the apparition failed to dissolve as expected. Oh, thank goodness, the visitor said, holding a hand to her forehead. I thought perhaps you weren't home. I desperately need help. Gretchen looked her up and down from the satin slippers to the jewels she wore in her ears. A carriage with a two-horse team stood in the lane, and Gretchen wondered at not having heard them arrive. I think you're looking for the fairy godmother. She lives a few fields over. Gretchen went to push the door closed, but the woman thrust her dainty foot in through the doorway. Oh no, I'm exactly where I need to be. Gretchen stared with her mouth agape as the maiden stepped into her kitchen and brushed off a stool with a delicate hand before perching on its edge. You must be going to the shindig over at the estate. Gretchen cocked her head. Hexes aren't my forte, if that's what you're after, and I refuse to deal in love potions after the last debacle. The woman tittered and waved her hand like Gretchen had made a joke. Do I look like I need a love potion to get the man I want? She unwound the scarf around her head, and her face sobered. No, I'm here because that harlot sheared off my hair. As the lady folded the scarf in her lap, Gretchen circled around her to inspect her cropped golden locks. Perfect coils hung to her chin, a little shorter at the back, which suited her long neck strung with baubles. Can't say I see the problem here. Looks nice if you ask me. The woman thrust her chin in the air and glowered. Of course it looks nice. But do you know who I am? I've a reputation to uphold. Gretchen smacked her lips and shrugged. I'm Rapunzel, you nitwit. The Rapunzel from the Tallest Tower franchise. She clicked her fingers. You know, a retreat among the clouds. Leave your troubles at the door. You get it? Because there is no door. Those swanky hotels. Gretchen nodded slowly. I've seen the posters. You're the one with her hair hanging out the window. I am the brand of the Empire. If I turn up to that party with my hair looking like this, I'll be a laughing stock. I see. Gretchen rubbed her chin. And ah, uh, this harlot is... Little upstart from up north, Rapunzel sneered, trying to sell spa packages in those stinking swamps she calls clay pools. Fiona's her name. I mean, who would look to an ogre for beauty treatments? I've heard a good mud bath does wonders for the skin. Of course, it was never popular when I was a youngster. Gretchen clicked her teeth shut at Rapunzel's glare and thrummed the table with her fingers. Can you make a hair potion or not? Well... Gretchen's eyes boggled as she remembered her potion over the fire and grabbed a pair of tongs to lift it clear. I have plenty of hair potions in my kit, but probably not the kind you're looking for. I'll take anything. Please, you have to help me. Gretchen prodded her potion with a spoon and poured the goopy liquid into a waiting jar. After setting the cauldron in the sink, she crossed to Rapunzel and yanked a few strands of hair from her scalp. Hey! She put a hand to her head with a wince. I presume you want to grow more of that hair and not an impressive rug on you back, H.M. Gretchen grabbed a clean cauldron and clucked her tongue at the dimming light outside her kitchen window. 
At the rate she was going, she wouldn't see her bed this side of midnight, and they hadn't even settled on a price yet. This will take a few hours to get right. Best you stop by in the morning to pick it up. And for these kinds of unplanned commissions, I expect twenty gold coins. Rapunzel drew a sharp breath through her nose. That's extortion. If you expect repeat business after taking advantage of a girl who's clearly over a barrel, you're out of your mind. I doubt there would be any repeat business. If I'm going to forego a decent night's sleep before the pumpkin competition, you can be damn sure I'll make it worth my while. She rubbed the strands of hair between her fingers and thumb and quirked an eyebrow. So what'll it be? A pumpkin what? Rapunzel screwed up her dainty features. Growing oversized vegetables is more important to you than garnering a high-profile customer. For what? Do you get a smoked ham or something if you win? Nah, just a crappy ribbon and the satisfaction of wiping that smug look from that Mildred's face. A whole year's worth of gloating. Of course, I can't be awful to her until after she hands out her pumpkin pies. Those things are amazing. But next time she gives me the side-eye at the market. Enough! Rapunzel held up her hand. You're right. There would have been no repeat business. I'm not sure I could have stood the banter. But I can't be seen in public like this. I will wait in my carriage until it is ready. She tugged her fur-trimmed cloak close as she swept out of the kitchen and into the dusk. Gretchen harumphed and set to work gathering what she'd need to put the potion together. Grumbling as she measured powdered antler, she lamented wasting the D-hair potion on Ewan. It would have served that chip right if she got to the Baron's party as bald as an egg. After adding the ingredients carefully, she pulled out one last bottle with care. Just a single drop. Any more would. The explosion blasted Gretchen to her rump, and she sat on the flagstone floor spluttering as a noxious cloud of smoke rose from the cauldron. She should have expected the girl would have all kinds of oils and waxes in her hair to make it shine like that. She picked herself up, cursing, and marched out to her yard to get another sample. More? Rapunzel recoiled into her plush carriage seat and held a hand to her chest. At this rate, I'll have none left. You're lucky I don't insist on dousing it with alcohol first. Gretchen rubbed a hand over her singed eyebrows. Now are you going to do it, or shall I? Rapunzel fetched a purse from beside her and drew out a small pair of golden scissors. I don't think so. I'll need its roots and all. Gretchen reached in through the window and plucked at a wisp peeking out from the scarf. Ouch! Rapunzel pouted and swatted at her hand. Had I known this would be so bothersome, I would have brought a wig instead. Gretchen rolled her eyes as Rapunzel drew the curtains closed, and the driver gave her an understanding shrug from his seat up front. Sighing, she turned back to her cottage. The light had almost completely faded indoors, and Gretchen stacked more wood on the hearth and lit candles carefully stowed in glass lanterns to illuminate her workspace. She cleared the mess of the last attempt and set the cauldrons in the sink to soak. With a smothered yawn, she prepared another batch of ingredients and carefully swabbed the hair with a cloth dipped in a clear distilled fluid, which she was sure wouldn't interfere with the potion. When she added the final drop to the solution, she heaved a sigh of relief as it emulsified into a smooth mixture. It would do the job, and if it was particularly potent, long hair or no, she would need the services of a good hairdresser every week for the next few months. She decanted the brew into a small jar and cleaned up the mess of the afternoon's concoctions, blinking away sleep that pulled at her eyelids. When her kitchen was back in order, she grabbed a jar from the table and shuffled out to the carriage with a shiver. The moon was high in the night sky and the horses and even the driver were snoozing despite the cold. After scratching against the carriage door, Gretchen frowned and pushed the curtain aside to see Rapunzel curled up on the bench seat slumbering. Too tired to care, Gretchen dropped the potion beside her and hustled back inside with plans to dive into bed and catch whatever hours of sleep remained before Jürgen arrived. Chapter 3 Gretchen took pity on the poor driver and his miserable beasts when she trod out to her garden in the morning. She fetched him a cup of tea with some toast and rustled up some carrots for the horses. Blessings on you, madam! He bobbed his head in time with the horses chewing their own morsels. Gretchen tipped her hat and marched to her pumpkin with her hands on her hips. 
It was the largest she'd ever managed. She was certain it was bigger than the one Mildred had carted with her last year. But Nora said Mildred's was plumper, unless she was just trying to wind her up. She pulled out the jar and fiddled with the stopper, weighing the probability of getting caught cheating. Every year she'd entered the competition. She'd tried all kinds of fertilisers. She applied every snippet of gardening law that she'd scoured from books and old-timers who claimed to have the secret source of vegetable production. She'd even tried tinkering with the seeds before she planted them, which had produced one of the worst results when they'd yielded bright blue pumpkins to the scorn of the other entrants. She just wanted to win once, just to earn a little respect. One item ticked on the bucket list, and from there she could loll around at the fair each year eating pumpkin pie and drinking the best brewed ale. Gretchen took a deep breath and sprinkled a spare dose over her prized produce and bit her lip as she waited for it to swell. A squeak came from the carriage behind her, and she spun to see a long leg stretch out the window, a satin slipper hanging from a toe. No. Gretchen gasped and turned back to her garden where her pumpkin was already sprouting its first tufts of golden hair. She sank to her knees. You've got to be kidding me! What have you done? Gretchen winced at the strangled screech. She could say goodbye to her payday, and losing twenty gold coins paled in comparison to the flack she'd cop for bringing a hairy pumpkin to the fair. The sounds of the driver scrambling to quiet the horses urged Gretchen to her feet, and as she drew close to the carriage, its door popped from its hinges. An arm waggled around, searching for purchase, as a second leg squeezed through the door. The carriage itself looked like a demented crab threatening to pop its shell at any moment. Gretchen grabbed hold of a flailing leg and pulled as hard as she could despite the hollering inside. There was no telling how big she'd get if she swallowed the whole darn potion. Trying not to tally up the revenue lost in that brew, she gritted her teeth and yanked the second leg clear of the door. What's going on here? Jürgen's familiar growl came from around the carriage. Quickly, before she busts the whole cabin! Rapunzel's hips wedged in the doorframe, and Jürgen recoiled as he rounded the corner. Her dress had popped open during the ordeal, and her bare rear end wiggled furiously in an attempt to slide free. Jürgen rushed in to manoeuvre her hips to escape the confines of the carriage. She slid out, arms overhead, and thumped to the ground in the fetal position. What have you done, you horrible woman? Look at me, I'm a monster! Tears spilled over her cheeks, the carefully painted coal running in inky streaks. Get something she can cover herself with. She waved a hand at Jürgen and squatted next to Rapunzel. You got the wrong potion. Think you have it rough? I've got hairy pumpkins over there. Hairy what? She sat up, her face bright red with rage. I don't care about your stupid pumpkins, witch. I came to you for a hair tonic and I'm the size of a giant. Gretchen tapped her nose and winked. Well, good news on that front. There's plenty of the hair tonic left, but I'll want restitution on account of having to shave my pumpkin before the competition. This, Rapunzel tapped Gretchen's chest with a finger the size of a zucchini, is your fault. You will fix this and be thankful I don't claim damage costs on my dress and carriage. Gretchen scrubbed a hand over her face and Jürgen returned with one of her curtains. She blinked at the drapes embroidered in vines, her favourite set that had hung in her living room for as long as she could remember. All right, we can fix this. Jürgen, are you handy with a razor? She pushed the curtain into Rapunzel's arms and turned to inspect the damage in her vegetable patch. Long locks hung off the pumpkin in delicate curls. We give it a once-over now and take care of the five o'clock shadow just before Nora officiates. If we're lucky, what about me? Rapunzel stood with the curtain pulled around her like a towel and glowered down at her. You can't leave me like this. It's no problem, really, Gretchen waved her hand. Spell should wear off by the time your party kicks off later. Should? What do you mean, should? And what about my hair? Gretchen squeezed her eyes shut and tossed the rest of the hair tonic into the air. When she opened them again, Rapunzel had the tiny jar to her lips. You can hide out here until later, and when you begin shrinking, you can head toward the Baron's estate. It's an hour at the most. Once the magic starts waning, it won't be long before you're back to normal. Rapunzel reached down to pluck Gretchen off the ground by her collar. I don't think you're listening. If you think you can pass that pumpkin off as anything other as a well-groomed abomination, you're out of your mind. 
Now, get back into that kitchen and brew something to put this right, or so help me, I will stomp your vegetable garden to bits. Rapunzel dropped her in a heap and tugged her curtain closer. Dusting herself off, Gretchen stood muttering under her breath. Well, that might have been possible if you hadn't just scarfed the hair potion, she huffed. Anything that could cancel out the growing brew, which would take hours I don't have to prepare, would also have those curls falling out faster than you could say yippee. Rapunzel fondled her curls, which were snaking their way down to the ground and pursed her lips. Well, you're not leaving me like this. Fine. Gretchen balled her fists at her side and swung her gaze to Jürgen. The pumpkin goes in the carriage and Miss Uppity here can ride in the wagon. Jürgen shrugged and turned to the garden while Rapunzel threw her arms up, almost losing her shroud in the process. A wagon? Looking like this? Your choice, Gretchen shrugged. I'm going. If you don't trust my word that you'll be fit for the party, you can hear it from Nora. Nora? Rapunzel bent closer. Is that the witch behind the Baron's infamous hexes? The very same, Gretchen clucked her tongue. She'll be officiating at the fair and I'm sure she won't mind giving a second opinion. Isn't that right, Jürgen? The troll hefted the pumpkin toward the carriage with a grunt. So long as she hasn't hit the brandy yet. Rapunzel narrowed her eyes and turned to her driver who was doing his best to keep his eyes anywhere but on his scantily clad employer. Finding no reassurance, her shoulders slumped and she hung her head. Fine, but you'll find me something more appropriate to wear. After arranging the pumpkins securely and lopping off what hair they could with a pair of shears, Gretchen left Jürgen to negotiate with the driver while she scoured her cottage for something more substantial for the overgrown lass. Coming up with nothing, she puffed out her cheeks and hauled out her spellbook, which was twitching in anticipation. She unbound its laces and tapped her toe. OK, no time for games. I need a clothes solution for a giant girl, pronto. Gretchen blinked when the book snapped open to a page already printed with a simple spell, with ingredients she kept among her stores. She kissed the hefty volume and tucked it back under the floorboards before racing back to her kitchen to prepare the charm. Without boiling, mashing, pounding or dicing, she pressed the ingredients into a cotton pouch and tied a long length of string around it. With a quick scratch behind Mulligan's ears, she locked her door and stepped into the morning sun, proffering the parcel to Rapunzel. What is this? She held the packet up to stare at it. Hang it around your neck and come down here, Gretchen beckoned with her finger. With only a little trepidation, Rapunzel slung the string around her neck and leaned down. Gretchen reached up to clasp the packet and muttered an incantation under her breath. Wind whipped around the pair and wisps of silver gathered around Rapunzel's frame. She stood with a squeak and smoothed hands over the flowing folds of her glimmering gown, the curtain dropping to her feet. This is, well, it's the finest dress I've ever seen. She hugged her frame and did a twist to catch sight of the back. Will this fit when I'm normal? Can't see why not. I don't see a size stitched in there. Gretchen nodded to Jürgen. Now let's get out of here. Not yet, Rapunzel snapped her fingers. Peter, I'll need my things. The driver scrambled to haul a trunk from the coach's back and Rapunzel settled on the ground, pouring through boxes. Gretchen screwed up her face as she watched and Rapunzel squawked in delight as she opened a box of paints which looked ridiculous in her substantial hands. Do you have a looking glass? She cocked her head. This one's a little small. She can't be serious. Jürgen threw up his hands. We don't have time for her to get dolled up for a wagon ride. You can use my floor mirror on one condition. Gretchen rubbed the bridge of her nose. You paint your face en route, and I want no grumbling about ruts in the road. Rapunzel waved a hand and tittered. I could paint my face upside down swinging from a tree if I had to. Gretchen smirked at the image it conjured in her mind and turned to fetch the mirror. OK, let's get this show on the road. Chapter 4 Rapunzel was as good as her word, and when they trundled into Oakdale, she sat in the wagon bed as pretty as a picture, smiling and twirling her hair at the gawkers they passed by. The pumpkin was a different story. Gretchen had done what she could on the ride, but the hair grew thick and fast. She fancied she had enough wholesale material to make a tidy sum from a wig tailor and tied the locks into manageable bunches to stow in her pouch for safekeeping. Had she been thinking clearly, 
she may have been able to stall long enough to make a magical dispel potion and scarper as soon as she'd doused her produce. But she had to play the hand dealt to her and hope the growth slowed over the coming hours. The fair consisted of food stalls and benches brought into the market square, with the agricultural competitions taking place in a nearby field. From the finest bulls to the softest wool, the region's commodities were on show, and merchants from the city sauntered from pen to pen, checking out the local talent. The vegetable growing competitions were something more of a novelty, and they relegated hopeful gardening enthusiasts to a narrow track of land pressed against the woodlands. Thankful at least for shade on the warm day, Gretchen stretched her arms overhead as she climbed out of the carriage. Gawking turned to suspicious whispers, and Gretchen picked out Nora in the crowd, elbowing her way toward her. What on earth is all this? Nora jerked her head toward the carriage and fixed Rapunzel with a shrewd stare. And who is she? Gretchen puffed out her cheeks and clapped her hands. I, uh, had quite the eventful afternoon after you left. You heard of those tallest towers hotels? This is the brand behind the operation, Rapunzel. Nora blinked. She's bigger than she looks in the posters. That's the problem, see? She wrapped an arm around her friend's shoulder and steered her away from the crowd. She came to see me about her hair, and there was a mix-up. Took a growing potion instead. Nora rounded on Gretchen, her eyes wide as she brushed her arm from her shoulder. That growing potion wouldn't have been for your entry, now, would it? Of course not, Gretchen swallowed. No, it was something I had on hand, and old Butterfingers here slipped her the wrong dose. Happens to the best of us. She won't believe me when I tell her it will wear off, so now I'm lumped with her until she starts shrinking. If you just have a word with her, assure her the effects are temporary. Where's the pumpkin? Nora levelled a finger at her. Resting. Just keeping out of the sun, you know. Can't have it getting soft spots. Nothing out of the ordinary. By the time we get started, it will be waiting in line with the others. I think you'll find... Hush, Nora shook her head. If there is anything irregular about that vegetable, I'll disqualify you faster than you can say potato. I won't have you throwing a shadow over my good reputation. People will already be running their mouths about this parade you've brought with you. With a groan, she turned toward the crowds and pushed her way back through the milling townsfolk. By the looks of things, the livestock was still centre stage, which was not unusual at those kinds of fairs but it meant she had a couple of hours before the spotlight would move toward their end of the fairgrounds. Curious folk had come closer to Rapunzel's wagon, and a few girls plucked up the courage to fondle stray locks of her luxurious hair. She smiled graciously at everyone, and chatted to the adults even as the girls began braiding her hair in lengths that looked like ropes from a distance. Evidently, she didn't mind looking out of place among the common folk. "'Are you okay? Jurgen clapped a hand on her shoulder. I should get to the ale stands. I need to keep on top of where the better brews can be found this season. Gretchen hung her head and nodded. I'll be fine. Thank you for everything this morning. I promise I'll have that broad out of your wagon by the time we need to head home. I don't mind. He barked a laugh. I'll keep the carriage if she wants to trade. Gretchen chuckled as he trudged away, and then she snuck over to the carriage, tugging the makeshift curtain door closed behind her. The next growth was well underway, and she sank to the bench seat, racking her brain for a magical solution to her problem. It couldn't be anything blatant. Nora wouldn't let her get away with it, and she had nothing in her inventory which would help with that particular problem. She took the shears out again and cropped what she could, resolving to put off the shaving until she could see the procession at the baked goods section. Gretchen's belly rumbled at the thought of the long tables strewn with pies and cakes, and she dropped the shears and dusted off her hands. Just a little mingling. Show her face among the competition and get a bite to eat. Hiding in the carriage could be seen as mean-spirited, and she didn't need anything else casting doubt over her entry. Giving her pumpkin a pat, she climbed from the carriage and ushered Peter the driver over, who was unhitching the horses and tethering them on a clear patch of grass. If you see anyone trying to poke their noses in this carriage, you use that whip to discourage them, you hear? I'll get us something to eat. Peter's face brightened at the mention of food, and he gave a nod as Gretchen strode into the throng. Rapunzel had gathered a crowd of her own from her wagon soapbox, and she spoke with arms waving toward the sky, her hair glittering in the sun. Gretchen didn't know what customers she expected to drum up among simple village people, 
But at the moment, she wasn't whining, and at least it looked like she'd shown up at a backwater fair for a reason. Other contestants already had their produce laid out on canvas sheets, with makeshift stools gathered around so they could smile and nod at those passing by. She tipped her hat to Farmer McBride, who was the merriest of all the losers, but he boasted that his pumpkins tasted the finest and did a good trade with the bakers. He gave a jolly wave back, and she continued her winding path around the spectators. An unlikely player in the pumpkin game was the butcher's wife, Rosalind, who waved as she went by, looking as proud as Punch over her considerable pumpkin. She usually placed somewhere in the top three every year. Gretchen did a detour around Mildred's setup, which had vines and smaller pumpkins carved into smiling faces decorating the lawn. She did that every year. Winning just wasn't enough. She had to do a song and dance about it. Checking over her shoulder to make sure she was clear, she scooted into the line of people who were admiring the baker's finest, with trays of public fare next to the fancier ones for the taste test. She rummaged in her pouch for a few gold coins and loaded up with savoury pies and sweet tarts. An accommodating ale cart stood at the end of the line, and Gretchen had her skin refilled before juggling the feast back to their setup. She thought she'd gotten clear of Mildred's view when the woman stepped in front of her with a smarmy smile. Gretchen thought you'd never arrive, and with such a grand entourage. She swatted Gretchen's arm with a snort. You do know it's the pumpkins that's being judged today, H.M. Oh, the carriage, Gretchen shrugged. Rapunzel's an old friend of mine. Couldn't resist a good PR stunt. She figured attaching her brand to my winning entry would draw some press. Mildred doubled over, clutching her belly as she chortled. Oh, stop! You'll give me the hiccups. I don't know what I'd do without you here. Someone has to be the comic relief. She patted Gretchen's shoulder and wiped her eye with her sleeve. Now, I've made plenty of pumpkin pies to celebrate my victory. Be sure to take a few extras for the road. She pressed her lips together in a sympathetic pout. I know how hard eking a living is for your sort. Turning her nose up, she caught the eye of someone behind Gretchen and elbowed past with an absent pat on the back. With teeth clenched and controlled breaths, Gretchen stormed back to the wagon and dropped her bundle beside Rapunzel. Peter followed soon after, and Rapunzel begged reprieve from her enraptured audience to turn toward the pair and eye the food greedily. I'm starved! Those people are unrelenting! It's not every day they meet a giant dressed as a wood nymph. Gretchen bit into a pie and sagged. And what has you in such a foul temper, coming to terms with the fact your ruse will not fool anyone? Like she could talk about foul tempers. Peter made off with his meal back toward the horses where he looked more comfortable. Rapunzel went straight for the tarts, and stuffed them in her mouth as though they were bite-sized pastries. Just one win, you know, Gretchen sighed. Just one year that I'm not laughed at. Is that too much to ask? I mean, it's not as if pumpkins are the hardest thing to grow. I've got a whole garden full of medicinals, and if you ask me, keeping the carpy vine growing through a hard frost... Tell me, Rapunzel interjected, what is the attraction exactly? You're a witch. Shouldn't you be entering spell competitions or some such? Gretchen pressed her lips together and toyed with the wineskin cork, unsure how to answer the question. My great-aunt Esme, Gretchen cleared her throat. Back in the day, she used to take home the ribbon every year, from the same patch of dirt I grow mine in. I never was a keen gardener, but it became a matter of family pride, particularly after Mildred came by with some sob story about her goat straying into the old mine. The last I ever saw of Aunt Esme was her flying off with a goat-luring mix set to camp that night by the cave. You blame your rival for doing away with your aunt? Rapunzel snorted. And here you are growing pumpkins instead of brewing hexes. You witches are a strange sort, you know. Gretchen groaned and shook her head. I told you I'm no good with hexes. Knowing my luck, I'd bring her good fortune for years to come. They finished their meal in silence with Rapunzel grumbling under her breath about the size of her stomach and Gretchen lying back swigging ale. Promising herself not to get inebriated before handling a razor, she corked the skin and passed a cursory eye over the crowd when she saw it. An unforgettable scalp. Ewan was a long way from the city. Chapter 5 Lady Luck Gretchen swung her legs to the grass. I can see his eyebrows from here, 
Rapunzel screwed up her face and Gretchen left her guessing as she burst off into the crowd. Ewan's shop in the city faced out into the marketplace, where other vendors erected their stalls each morning. It was the main reason he got around the market, looking like he had a stick up his backside. He dealt in finely tooled leather items and boasted whenever he could about the contracts he had with the Royal Armoury. It figured he'd need to source his leather somewhere, and Gretchen had never paid mind to the rows of makeshift pens that stank of animal leavings. He was getting away at a good clip juggling a pie and a tankard of ale, chatting with a man who bore a familial resemblance, with a full head of hair. Gretchen sidled past onlookers, and people standing around chattering in walkways, and cut the pair off in the intersection of wool displays and blocks of lanolin. Ewan! Gretchen threw her arms up with a grin. Fancy seeing you here, pal! His eyebrows were indeed intact and furrowed as he glared at her. The witch from the marketplace, charlatan, fraudster and rogue operator. His lip curled as he turned to his companion. This is the one I told you about. The smothered smirk told Gretchen the guy saw the funny side of her hairy prank. Listen, ah, uh, I can see from your eyebrows, she pointed vaguely at her own, that you thought better of my D-hair potion. So, if you want to give it back, we'll just call it even, yeah? His face turned mottled red, and he bunched his fists at his sides. Of course I didn't fall for your ruse. He reached up to scratch his neck. I wanted to put a stop to your wicked schemes. I know your sort. Give them something with unexpected consequences and charge exorbitant fees to put it right again. Give it time, and the word will spread about you. Mark my words. You won't sell so much as a sniffle tonic after that. Gretchen drew a deep breath through her nose and gritted her teeth. This wouldn't be easy. Look, do you have it with you or not? It seems you have me over a barrel, as it were, and I'm willing to play nice to make a deal. Ewan burst out in a raucous laugh, slapping his companion's back. Gretchen was thinking it may be his brother, and from the look of calculation in his eye, she wagered he'd won the brains in the family. Prepared for an involved negotiation and cataloguing what she had on hand to offer, she clapped her hands to get Ewan's attention. What is it you want, Ewan? Like I said from the start, I can brew you a tonic that will give you a luscious head of hair by morning. You'll have women braiding flowers in it with wistful looks in their eyes all day long. I'll take care of that impressive pelt you've got going on down your back too. All's I need is that potion back. It was the brother's turn to chuckle, and Ewan's face sobered as he looked at her with contempt. I don't believe a word of it. You won't have your vile concoction back until I see proof. Gretchen scrubbed a hand over her face, knowing full well she didn't have what she needed on hand to mix a potion, even if she could find someone willing to lend her a cauldron. I need that potion now, and it will take days to get a hair brew like that right. What else do you need? Surely you aren't at a county fair to drink in the sights. We're in negotiations, the brother piped up, with the butcher who has signed a contract with a grazier from up north. Forgive my brother, my name is Cal. Ewan glared, but Cal gave him a dismissive wave. Pleased to meet you, Cal. Now, I suspect these negotiations are... problematic. The reason why our goods are the finest is a matter of the quality of the raw product we work with. He pressed his lips together. The bargain is stuck on the issue of delivery. The butcher would prefer to make less frequent trips to the city, and we cannot agree to have our materials drying out in his storerooms. I see. The cogs in Gretchen's mind turned as she tried to figure out a plausible way to help the transaction. Who's the butcher? Cal's eyebrow twitched to a spot behind him where Rosalind's husband Billy stood yammering with some other shop owners from her own small town. Gretchen had been a customer for years and felt villainous when she'd started buying from the guy in the city after long days manning her stall. Well, um... Gretchen patted her pouch, racking her brain on what kind of potion fixes a problem like that. Let me talk to the guy. Ewan opened his mouth to protest, but Cal clamped a hand on his shoulder to silence him. Gretchen left them to mutter in animated tones at one another and sauntered towards Billy. Gretchen! He lifted his tankard in greeting, his face already flushed from drink. How's the pumpkin competition coming along? I think my Rosalind is in with a fine chance this year. She's been crooning over her garden for weeks now. If only she'd croon like that for me. Good to see you, Billy. Rosalind's harvest looks spectacular. But if I could have a word about something else. I was starting to think you'd blown yourself to bits or something. 
he chortled. You haven't been by in weeks. I had to feed most of the gizzards you usually buy to the dogs. Not that they complained, and it's not like I could sell it to anyone else. Gretchen felt her cheeks burn, and she scratched her head as she scrambled for an excuse. Just on one of those cleansing diets, you know. Read about this one in the Witch's Digest. Supposed to be good for your chakras. Of course, it only lasted a few weeks before everything started to taste like sulphur, and I feel just as unbalanced as I usually do. Pa, Billy waved a hand. You should give up listening to that rubbish. A good feed of liver is what you need. I'll be by in a few days. Gretchen nodded and reached to tap his shoulder as he turned back to his buddies. But I need to talk to you about something. I hear you have a deal going with some leather smiths from the city. That lot? He rolled his eyes. They want me to bring them a new delivery every week. Never heard anything more absurd in my life. There's nothing at all wrong with my cellar, and if they think they can bully me into scurrying into the city whenever they crook their finger, they've got another thing coming. Listen, I need this deal to work out. They have something of mine, and I need it back. What would you be agreeable to? Billy looked momentarily befuddled and smothered a belch with the back of his hand. I said I'd make a trip once every three weeks, same as always. I bring in cured meats for the palace and bring back salts for the shop. There'll be no special deliveries. If it's good enough for the palace, it's good enough for the likes of them. He had a point, and if Billy only made the trip every three weeks, they were poles apart on a settlement. Unless there was a third party who was making a trip to the city regularly. Billy... How thick is a rolled hide? Gretchen narrowed her eyes. He frowned and held his hands up in an approximation. Why? Gretchen undid the laces of her infinity pouch and held its mouth as far as it would stretch. When Billy screwed up his face, she thrust her arm in up to her shoulder and waggled her eyebrows. Well, I'll be. Billy rubbed his chin. Full of tricks, your sort. Shame it would be too narrow. Gretchen chewed her lip and sagged. What if you sliced the hides in half? Don't ask me, he shrugged. It's them who are the fussy buggers. Gretchen spun on her heel and cast around for the pair. They'd since moved on, and she muttered a curse under her breath. The crowds had thickened around the baker's section. She was running out of time. Elbowing past people who were dawdling, she pushed in the opposite direction toward the livestock and combed the aisles before spotting Ewan's scalp. She groaned and trotted toward them, ignoring Ewan's curled lip when he saw her. I have, she gulped a mouthful of air, a plan. There's no chance old Billy will make a delivery once a week, but I travel to the city most days. Cal rolled his finger in the air impatiently. Now, given I'm on a broomstick, there will have to be a compromise. I can't carry a full skin in my pouch, but if we slice them in half, I can bring as many as you'd like. She unstrung her pouch and Cal's eyes boggled as she gave the same demonstration she'd shown Billy. Is that from Elod's Emporium? How does one such as... Don't believe a word of it, Ewan interjected. She's not to be trusted, and cutting the hides will only make for more wastage, which eats into our profits. Cal waved his brother to silence. They will do well enough for straps and scabbards. The ones from the butcher can serve for the larger items. Do we have a deal, then? Billy comes by every three weeks, and I'll come past for the other two. Gretchen held up a finger. Only for this season, mind. When a new contract comes around, we can negotiate a fee. Cal pressed his lips together and drew a deep breath, his eyes holding hers. Finally, he gave a tight nod and patted his brother on the shoulder. Ready a contract. Then give her what she wants. Chapter 6 Drawing up the contract was tedious with Ewan left to the particulars, and Gretchen sprinted back to the carriage with her de hair potion as the crowd milled around the vegetable displays. She flew past Nora, who gave her an impatient frown and dived in the carriage's side to her hairy produce. The growth was out of control, and she had to hack away at the mess of curls to be sure the pumpkin was still underneath it. Uncorking the bottle with her teeth, she sprinkled it over the top and rubbed the elixir into the orange flesh. Come on! She spat the cork out and pulled at the hair. Out you come! It started at the tips, golden locks turning brown and shriveling, and crept up toward the roots where they broke away from the skin. Gretchen wiped the mess away, her nose twitching at the dust, 
and marvelled at the clean surface left behind. No sign of unnatural follicles or spots. With a victorious whoop, she pushed aside the curtain and grinned at Rapunzel, who had come to take a look. What have you done? She craned her neck to get a better look. You were gone for ages. Just a D-hair potion I whipped up. Gretchen shined her fingernails on her shirt. Cost a year's worth of hauling around sacks of skin, but I'll wager this thing is bigger than Mildred's. Rapunzel's eyes widened, and Gretchen spun to follow her gaze. The pumpkin shuddered, its flesh rippling. Is it supposed to do that? Gretchen's mind raced. The pumpkin had two dowsings of magic in one day, one to counter another. It wasn't out of the realms of probability that it could cause some instability. She glared at the vegetable, daring it to try again, and it sat inanimate, like nothing had happened. A side effect is all, Gretchen coughed. Now, we need to get this baby to the contest. I don't know where Jürgen's gotten to, but I can't carry it out myself. Rapunzel eyed the pumpkin askance, but shrugged, waving Gretchen away so she could get hold of it. As she hefted it toward the line of contestants, Gretchen ripped her curtain free of the carriage doorway and trotted ahead to lay it out on the grass. When Rapunzel lowered it to the ground, Gretchen fancied she'd heard a rumble, but pushed worry from her mind and stood proudly in line. What took you so long? Farmer McBride nodded up the line where Nora already had her measuring tape out and was sizing up Mildred's entry. Had to see a gal about a cat! Gretchen shrugged and held a hand to her belly which churned with nerves. It didn't take long for Nora to make her way down the procession, first divining for any magical interference and then measuring both the height and girth of each pumpkin. She threw a few suspicious glances her way, but Gretchen only waved back with a smile. That thing sounds like it's got a belly ache, Rapunzel hissed. She was bent almost double, and Gretchen eyed her over with a frown. If anything, she was getting bigger as time went on. Her hair was growing at a good rate too, now flowing around her ankles, though her dress had kept up with her height. Gretchen turned to the pumpkin and held a hand to its side, feeling for anything out of the ordinary. It's nothing, it just has to last a few more minutes. Rapunzel shook her head and stamped off back to the wagon, evidently not convinced by Gretchen's reassurances. Measuring Farmer McBride's hall was barely worth the effort, but she'd give it to Nora. She did so with genuine severity and respect. He acknowledged the measurements with a nonplussed shrug and turned with interest to watch Nora size up Gretchen's pumpkin. He wasn't the only onlooker. The rest of the competitors had followed Nora after their turn with the measuring tape and smiled on at their rivals. The only sour look among the bunch belonged to Mildred, who watched with arms folded in front of her. Be sure to be thorough with that one, she sniped. The rest of us aren't witches with the means to inflate our chances. Nora took the remark in her stride and stood somberly in front of Gretchen's pumpkin. Closing her eyes, she held hands out in front of her to sense any lingering magical trace. She stood for a full few minutes, lips twitching and brows furrowing, but when she opened her eyes, she smacked her lips and shrugged. I can't detect any foul play here. This entry qualifies. Gretchen held her breath as Nora shuffled around, taking each measurement, refraining from tapping her toe as Nora fiddled with the tape. This is a close one, Nora announced. Less than an inch difference between the top two contenders. But I'm pleased to announce that this year's winner of the Oakdale County Fair's largest pumpkin competition is... Gretchen's eyebrows climbed her forehead as the pumpkin rumbled, its flesh twitching like it had a bad case of gas. She leaped out of the way just as it exploded, showering the onlookers in an orange spray of pulp and seeds. Shouts came from all around, and although a sticky mess covered Nora's back, it was Mildred's face that got splattered in slimy muck. Cheater! Mildred cried. Blatant fraud! Why, I wouldn't be surprised if that thing wasn't even a pumpkin to start with. Farmer McBride scraped his finger along the remnants of the busted vegetable and stuck it in his mouth. A hush fell over the onlookers as he rolled his tongue over his teeth with a thoughtful look. That's a pumpkin, if ever I've tasted one. Not as sweet as mine, but that's to be expected. She's disqualified. Never in my life have I heard of an exploding pumpkin. There's witchcraft in this, and... Silence! Nora bellowed. I haven't announced the winner yet! She swung around to glare at Gretchen and wiped mush from the back of her hat. The onlookers squirmed as they brushed themselves off and Gretchen swallowed. 
The winner of this year's competition is Mildred Sampson, at 103 inches. Mildred's eyes blazed, victorious, as she puffed herself up and turned to the crowd. People either groaned or cheered as they kicked around pieces of pumpkin, and Farmer McBride sighed in resignation. I vote that Nora be deposed as the judge of these competitions. Mildred held a finger up. We all know those two are as thick as thieves, and as an official she was prepared to overlook cheating so her buddy wouldn't be blackmarked for next year. Now hold on there a minute, Farmer McBride waved an arm. It was you that insisted on having a witch preside over this competition, way back when Esme was winning most years. And Nora has handed you plenty of blue ribbons, Mildred Sampson. We should let Gretchen answer for these irregularities. Eyes turned toward Gretchen, and shame bloomed in her belly. The accusation in Nora's eyes was the hardest to bear, and Gretchen licked her lips, searching for the right words. Well, I mean, in fairness, there isn't a single drop of performance-enhancing substances on that mess. I doused it with a hair-growing potion that got out of hand, and when I counted it with a de-hair potion, it became unstable. She closed her eyes and drew a deep breath before pushing on. But that only happened because I'd fully intended on cheating. Did the old switcheroo and ended up with a giant hotel mogul instead. Gretchen hung her head, and the crowd muttered around her. Mildred's voice rang out again, shrill above the cacophony. Magical meddling. She admitted it with intent to cheat. She should receive a life ban, and I still stand by what I say about. Gretchen looked up as Nora hurled a glob of pulp at Mildred's head. Everything went silent as it struck her hair, washing down her neck and shoulders. Nora stood heaving sharp breaths with a murderous glare, and Mildred stood frozen, her mouth agape. Chaos ensued. Slushy projectiles hurled in every direction joined the first snort of laughter in a chorus of cackling. Gretchen smothered a giggle as she ducked at an incoming shot and took cover behind the remains of the pumpkin's shell. The sounds of screeching indicated that Mildred had come out of her stupor and Gretchen poked her head up just in time to get sprayed by a particularly wet clod of pulp. Farmer McBride gave her a toothy grin and waggled his fingers just as Rosalina snuck up behind him and pushed a handful onto his bald pate. Gretchen squawked with laughter and lay back on the printed curtain holding her belly. It didn't take long for the brawl to quiet down once most of the muck was stuck to people's Sunday best and all that littered the ground was fleshy husk. The crowd melted off toward the rest of the fair and Gretchen scrubbed a hand over her face with a snigger. Mildred had gone nowhere though and stood with her hands on her hips glaring at her. You should be ashamed of yourself, Gretchen Mirkwood. If your Aunt Esme could see you now... Don't you dare bring her into this, Gretchen held up a warning finger. Missing goat, my foot. You just wanted her out of the picture. And when I find out what happened in that cave, mark me. You'll have worse than pumpkin on your face. Mildred gasped as if struck, hand held to her chest. Nora's eyes bulged and the few gawkers remaining scuttled away. You think, Mildred's mouth worked, that I had something to do with her disappearance? Gretchen folded her arms and looked Mildred in the eye. If the shoe fits. Mildred's eyes glistened as she stood mute, her shoulders shuddering with silent sobs. She was one of my dearest friends, she sniffled. I may have asked her to fetch my best back, but I never imagined anything like that would happen. Try as she might, Gretchen couldn't see a lie in those words, only the wretched look on Mildred's face. She swallowed, wiping at a tear of her own and hung her head to school her face back to calm. We may have been a little overzealous when it came to competitions, your aunt and I, her voice quavered, but I miss her sorely. There hasn't been a day that's gone by when I haven't blamed myself. Gretchen frowned and looked up, but Mildred was already walking away back to her own cart, past people packing up their displays. Nora patted Gretchen on the back and heaved a sigh. I suppose you don't even have a charm to fix all this mess. You really are a pain in my rear end, you know. I'll hear about this from the Baron. Is the messy part over? Nora and Gretchen turned to regard Rapunzel, who stood clear of the destruction with her tiny scissors, absently trimming the ends of her long locks. Good grief, Gretchen. If anything, that girl is getting bigger. And what on earth is she wearing? Chapter 7 I'd say she's bigger by at least a few feet, Jurgen rubbed his chin. Gretchen groaned and took a swig of ale. 
She'd been arguing with Nora for close to an hour before the troll turned up to give his opinion. But the point is, it will wear off. Not in time for tonight's party. You said it would be a few hours at the most. Rapunzel sat cross-legged on the grass with her arms folded in front of her. What's wrong with being big anyway? You run an empire based on height. I doubt she'd even get through the door. Nora tilted her head. Fancy brewing such a potent potion and wasting it like this. All right, fine. The party is at the Baron's estate. We can use your glorified dungeon to brew something to counteract it. If you expect me to take one more potion after seeing what happened to that pumpkin, you're sadly mistaken. Rapunzel turned her gaze to Nora. What is your expert opinion? Well, Nora circled around her, tapping her fingers together. The safest thing to do would be to let it take its course. If you ingested the potion this morning, with the rate of growth, perhaps by tomorrow evening it will have worn off. Rapunzel opened her mouth in outrage, and Nora waved her to silence. Of course, I expect that won't be to your liking, so I may be able to fix up a charm to make you look smaller. Can't have you splattered all over the walls now, can we? Rapunzel nodded vigorously, and Nora gave her a grandmotherly smile. Now, hop into the cart and we can be on our way. Rapunzel pushed to her feet, calling out for Peter, the driver, and Nora's smile disappeared as she rounded on Gretchen. You owe me for this. I won't see a single copper coin for sorting it out, and don't think you'll get away with scurrying home. You can give an account to the Baron himself to clear my good name. Gretchen chewed her lip and turned to Jurgen with a quirked eyebrow. Well, she still has my cart. I've already paid for ten barrels of cider, but I can put them in the carriage for now. Besides, he flashed a toothy grin. I'll bet there'll be plenty of fancy food at the estate tonight. Good, Nora clapped her hands. Now let's get moving. I expected to fly home tonight, not dawdle along country roads. It didn't take long before Peter had the horses hitched, and they ambled out of the field and back through the town of Oakdale. With only a short stop to collect Jurgen's supplies, they got a head start on the rest of the fairgoers, who by then were well into their cups. Nora and Gretchen sat together on the back of the carriage, with their feet dangling off the side, watching dust clouds billow in their wake. Mildred's family are old blood, you know? Nora absently fiddled with a long stand of straw. Still hold a lot of influence with the well-to-do around here. Gretchen closed her eyes and rested her head on the back of the carriage. Do you really care all that much about presiding over a pumpkin-growing competition? I'm surprised you aren't handing out ribbons for the prize pigs. Or maybe you could taste test those cakes. That's the kind of judging I could get around. It may seem silly, Nora huffed, but it's a matter of reputation. I never much cared for it at the start, but I've been doing it for years. They have tied my infamy to hexes and curses for as long as I can remember. It wasn't until I started judging that I could walk down the street and have some people, just some, smile and nod at me. Gretchen let the idea sink in her mind, remembering the times when she'd passed people gossiping about the hideous witch at the estate who paid wicked retribution to any who scorned the baron. She'd always thought it was something Nora was proud of, but she was no stranger to feeling like an unpleasant necessity of society. I, well, I'm sorry for setting you up like that. I had no idea it meant so much to you. You'll be the death of me, Gretchen Mirkwood. Nora reached over to squeeze her hand. But I'll never forget the look on Mildred's face when her face got plastered in pumpkin. Both witches giggled and settled back into companionable silence. You know Mildred had nothing to do with Esme's disappearance, don't you? They never did find that goat, Gretchen pursed her lips. She might not know what happened, but there had to be some kind of foul play. I will find out one day. Lord help us. Nora sighed and settled back on her perch with her eyes closed. They arrived at the estate at twilight, and by the carriages lined up out front it looked like the party was off to a flying start. Nora directed Jürgen and Peter around the back, where they pulled up by the stables proper with Rapunzel huddling as best she could under Gretchen's pumpkin-splattered curtain. That was Fiona's carriage, she hissed as she climbed out of her hiding spot. I'll bet she's stealing my business as we speak. Gretchen shrugged at Nora's questioning look. Some ogre beauty queen selling swamp bath getaways. Nora gave an appreciative nod and caught herself when Rapunzel glowered at her. Heard those things give you warts. Rapunzel narrowed her eyes at the witch, 
then looked around the courtyard between the stables and the looming house. The servants who went about their business did so with sullen looks and dragging feet, paying no mind to Nora's curious companions. Peter stayed behind with a word about caring for the horses, and they made a break for it to the stone steps that led down to Nora's subterranean dwelling. Rapunzel had to crawl over the threshold with a wiggle of her hips, and inside she sat with her knees hugged to her chest, blowing cobwebs that hung from the rafters from her face. Nora clapped her hands with a muttered incantation, and large crystals mounted on the walls gave off a warm glow. And you think my place is a dump? Gretchen snorted and stretched her back. It's not like she spends much time here, Jurgen snickered, but Nora silenced him with a glare. This is my workroom. My living quarters are in the estate proper. Gretchen trailed a finger along a dusty shelf with a wry grin. Explains it even more. Nora threw up her hands and went to rummage through an odd assortment of rocks and crystals on the far wall. Jurgen sank to a bench seat by a table that dominated the space, and Gretchen wandered over to see what Nora was poking through. We need a good light conductor for this kind of thing. Illusions aren't something I enjoy working with. She tossed aside an amethyst and held up a hunk of quartz to the light. Now, I know I had one here someplace. She fumbled around the back of the shelf and held up a perfectly clear crystal. Aha! Uh -huh. Have you ever seen a sunstone before? Gretchen took the crystal and held it aloft. It was clearer than any crystal she'd ever seen, but like Nora, they weren't an interest of hers. That one was about the size of a strawberry, dwarfed by the other composites lining Nora's shelves. Isn't it a bit small? She weighed it in her palm and handed it back. You'll find its properties make up for its size. Nora bustled back to the table and cleared a spot among the forgotten debris. She set it down gently and went to fetch an assortment of jars from a cupboard. The clearest form of calcite to be found. Costs a pretty penny too. It bends light in equal measure to produce a double image. Gretchen sank beside Jürgen to watch Nora at work with keen interest. It wasn't often that a witch allowed an audience to spell castings. Cast the same kind of charm on an inferior crystal and it won't hold up to scrutiny. She sniffed at a jar of powder and set it aside with a grimace. From the wrong angle, she'd likely look even bigger. And we can't have that now, can we? Rapunzel shook her head frantically and held her knees even closer despite Nora's warm smile. Where did my chalk get to? I must sketch out fairly complex circle. The thick stuff just won't do. Who do I have to scare to get some food around here? Jürgen held his head propped on the table and his belly gurgled audibly. Oh. Nora's eyes widened as though she'd forgotten about his presence entirely and she waved toward the door. Go see the cook. If she gives you any trouble, remind her the spoiling wards need seeing to in the cellar, so I'll be having none of that gruel she feeds to the rest of the poor wretches around here. If you go through the courtyard... Jürgen was already off his stool and halfway to the door. I'll find it. Now, what was I saying? Nora frowned at her assembled goods. Ah, yes. A circle, the stone, and a good mix of powdered pixie and golden tortoise beetle. Now what did you put in that enlarging potion? Gretchen rattled off a list of common herbs and powders, and the oils infused with some of the more expensive ingredients. Really? Nora snorted. I'm surprised you made more than a marinade with that. Some alchemist must have given you the top shelf stuff by mistake. Never mind. There's nothing that should interfere. Nora snapped her fingers, and a broom in the corner came to life. It pushed dust across the floor from a clear spot where the only narrow window near the ceiling cast a round pool of moonlight onto the cold flagstones. Gretchen looked to Rapunzel, whose eyes peered over her knees as she huddled, shivering by the door. Perhaps we should get her somewhere more comfortable. Gretchen nodded toward the girl. I'm not going anywhere. Her sleeves muffled the words. If I'm seen by that upstart, she will make my life hell. Gretchen pursed her lips and reached into her infinity pouch to produce a small stone. Setting it on the floor beside Rapunzel, she muttered over it until it flared with the kind of cheery warmth one could expect from a crackling fire. Rapunzel held her hands out with a frown and scooted a little closer. Thank you. She licked her lips. I know you meant no harm, despite all this mess. Gretchen clucked her tongue. You know what? For a noble type, you've been a pretty good sport about it. It's not every day you see someone like you mingling with everyday folks. You had quite the audience at the fair. 
Rapunzel shrugged and gave a small smile. Truth be told, I'm not used to being a noble type. I grew up just as regular as the next girl, if a little isolated. I have heard stories about that, said Gretchen, curling her lip, but I can't say I put much stock with what's on public record. The prince is coming to save me thing, Rapunzel rolled her eyes. That guy was a complete dropkick. I got out of that drafty pile of stones he called a castle as quick as I could and started the tallest tower empire. Of course, we're still technically married, so that comes with its own set of pedigree benefits. Like rubbing shoulders with this lot? Gretchen jerked a thumb toward the ceiling. Precisely. Rapunzel loosened up as the warming stone did its work, and Gretchen waved her hand over it to take it back a couple of notches. The sound of a jar hitting the ground drew her attention, and when she turned, Nora stood bent, holding her head. Darn shelf gets me every time. She waved her broom toward the spilled mess and stepped back to admire her work. Gretchen wandered over to inspect the patch on the floor. A spreading spiral wound out toward the edges of the moonlit circle, with glyphs marking particular spots along the way. It was tidy work, and although the spiral grew, Gretchen had to blink twice to put it in perspective. It seemed like it got smaller, which she knew formed part of the charm. Nice work, she clapped her companion on the back. That would have taken me hours and as many curses. Nora scoffed at that, although her cheeks bloomed red at the praise. Settling herself on the floor and setting the sunstone at the centre of the circle, she sprinkled the dust in a winding path and closed her eyes with hands hovering over the assembled items. Gretchen backed away hastily as Nora muttered, the hairs on the back of her neck prickling already. There was nothing she detested more than exposure to the magical energy of others. How long will it take? It came as a hushed whisper, and Rapunzel's eyes were as round as an owl's. For this kind of thing, not long. It's more a case of precision. Gretchen wiped at the tickle in her nose. I hope so, anyhow. Jurgen burst through the door, making the pair jump. He juggled a heaped basket of goods and a small cask. The smell wafting in through the doorway was magnificent, though Gretchen waved the troll to silence before he could distract Nora from her task. She took the basket from his grasp and set it gently on the table, and Jürgen mimicked her muted movements as he placed the cask beside it. By the time they had cleared enough room to make for a proper dining table, Nora stood with a hand to her forehead. Doing that kind of work after a long day is a sure way to give oneself a thumping headache. She groaned as she lowered herself onto the only padded chair at the table. So is it done? Rapunzel crawled closer eagerly. Yes, keep the stone in your pocket and you'll be back to your normal self. Nora held a finger up. Or look like yourself in any case. What pocket? Rapunzel reached over to pluck the stone from the circle and Jürgen dropped a drumstick on his scavenged plate. Rapunzel was indeed the right size, and as bare as the day she was born. Chapter 8 Nora held her head in her hands at the screeching, as Rapunzel curled up to cover her bare body. Jürgen swung around on his seat, apparently deciding to stare at the wall, and Gretchen's mouth hung open as she pieced together what had happened. The stone, girl. Drop the stone! Rapunzel tossed the sunstone across the floor and it skittered to Gretchen's feet. Rapunzel's dress returned with a shimmer, along with her impossibly long limbs. Jürgen scraped his chair across the floor and gathered an armful of food before striding out of the room without a word, his cheeks scarlet. What on earth? Nora screwed up her face and stood to run a hand along the illusory garment. I thought that was a charm dress, not a dress that is a charm altogether. She held fists to her hips as she rounded on Gretchen. I, uh, well, I didn't even think about that. But I suppose it makes sense in hindsight, one illusion countering the other. She rubbed her chin. But I've got to say, I'm pretty impressed with that dress. Didn't even need one crystal. You know for a witch, sometimes you're a real half-wit. Nora drew a sharp breath through her nose. Didn't occur to you to even mention that you'd already fitted the girl out with an illusion charm? What am I going to do now? Rapunzel scrubbed tears from her cheeks with her fist. The other dress is ripped from one end to the other. Well, I was never much good at stitching spells. 
If you don't believe me, you should ask Jürgen about the time I had to take care of a gash on his head. Gretchen gave a nervous giggle and swallowed when Nora and Rapunzel glared at her. But we're at one of the fanciest houses for miles. There's got to be a dress lying around somewhere. The Baron's daughter, Nora puffed out her cheeks. The young chit has as many dresses as days in the season. I can make it bigger, but there'll be no getting in there with the house so busy. Gretchen reached to pick up the crystal on the floor, and Nora and Rapunzel's heads whipped toward her, or on a place lower to the ground where they thought she was. They won't even know I'm there. Just tell me which way to go and I'll be back in a jiffy. Although unable to keep the smirk from her face, Nora gave her directions through the sprawling house. Taking a last longing look at the food on the table, Gretchen left through a door that led deeper into the lower floors and found a set of spiral stairs to climb toward the populated areas of the house. When she emerged into a hallway, she checked both ways before scurrying to the right to search for the next set of stairs to take her upward toward the bedroom suites. She paid no mind to the servants passing her along the way, with tired eyes fixed straight ahead above her level. But once she stepped onto the plush carpets where the family's residence lay, she slowed to listen out for the sounds of footfalls. Third on the left, she muttered, craning her neck to count the doors. Creeping close to the wall, she tiptoed along, glancing each way to check for those who would apprehend her for intruding. But Nora was right. The Baron had made a poor choice keeping his people from their festivities, and Gretchen wagered more than a few had snuck away for the night. When she got to the right door, she pressed her ear to the lacquered timber, and when she turned the handle it swung open without a squeak. This is all too easy, Gretchen wandered in and pushed the door closed behind her. I could be in here stealing a fat purse of jewels. Spotting several armoires set against the far wall, she opened the first and swept a cursory glance over the frills and lace spilling out. Cursing herself for neglecting to ask what Rapunzel liked, she flipped through every shade of violet and pink looking for something. Gretchen stood stumped. At home she kept one fancy dress, and by fancy it looked like all her other black dresses, except for the silver buttons. Giggling in the hallway snapped her out of her quandary, and as the handle on the door rattled, she dived into the armoire and closed the door behind her. I never thought we'd get away. Did you see Liza's dress, positively? The wet, smoochy sound sent a shiver of revulsion down Gretchen's spine, and she batted away an errant strand of lace tickling her chin. Of course, it was too easy. The sound of something hitting the floor, perhaps from the nightstand, and the creaking of timber made her stomach churn. She would not be party to that kind of nonsense. Snatching a random dress from its hanger in the dark, she felt around in her pouch for something that might be useful. Cataloguing her items in a magical set of shelves had been tricky to get used to, but she was glad she'd figured out a kind of system, and when her fingers clasped a vial much shorter than the rest, a grin spread over her face. Opening the door a crack, she unplugged the stopper and rolled the cylindrical vial across the floor and counted to ten. When smooching turned to coughs, she took a deep breath and launched from the wardrobe into the smoke-filled room and wrenched the door open to make a getaway. No longer caring about being waylaid, she sprinted down the hallway, almost smacking face first into a servant carrying a laden tray, and flew down the stairs to the lower floors. She slowed only to a fast walk on that level and heaved a sigh of relief when she arrived at the cold stone steps leading to the underground floors of the house. Paying no mind to the screeching of rats as she made her way back to Nora's workroom, she swung the door open victoriously and held the dress up as she dropped the stone on the table. It's hideous. Rapunzel's face mirrored Nora's, both held rigid in disdain. Gretchen looked the dress up and down and swallowed. Fuchsia pink lace and bows were sewn into every inch of the bust and sleeves. It looked like a cake gone horribly wrong, and Gretchen dropped the dress to the floor in disgust. Well, it was the best I could do. That girl came waltzing in, entertaining her male companion. I had a wretched time getting out of there unseen. Gretchen dropped to the bench and held her head in her hands. As it stands, that room will have its own special smoke cloud for days. Nora chortled at that, but the sound of Rapunzel sobbing tore at Gretchen's heart. I'm sorry, Rapunzel. You should have never come to me. I can't do anything right. The girl wept openly, 
not bothering to brush away the tears, and Nora pushed a handkerchief into her palm. There, there, now why don't you clean yourself up and we can talk about how silly you're being? Rapunzel blew her nose and hiccuped. Silly? I saw you out there on that cart today. Had people flocking to you to admire that shiny hair and pretty dress. But they listened too. Gretchen lifted her head and watched Rapunzel run fingers through her hair. You've built an empire selling lofty heights as the most exclusive hotels in the realm. The pinnacle of elegance. Nora waved a hand down her limbs. Much like yourself. Don't let some half-rate competitor get you down. In your business, you want to stand out. And in that dress with those long legs, nobody can say accuse you of being mediocre. All you have to do is wear a little confidence with that ensemble. With the grandmotherly smile and hands folded in front of her, Nora accomplished what Gretchen had been nattering about all day. Rapunzel's eyes blazed brilliant blue and she lifted her head in the air. I'm rather striking. She ran her hands along her shimmering dress. And that ogre is in there snatching up your clients. Why would they want a mud bath when they could have the pristine air among the clouds? That's right, Rapunzel sat up a little straighter. The purity of our rainwater is second to none. It wasn't just your clothes that got you out of that tower, or even your hair. It was a girl who put her mind to something and did it with whatever she had on hand. A dose of theatrical dramatics shined in Nora's eyes. Rapunzel twisted her mouth and nodded her eyes burning with intensity, and saw a commercial opportunity and climbed right back up there. I can do this. I've handled worse before. Go get em, kid. They'll love you. Nora clapped her hands together, and Rapunzel crawled with determination toward the door. After wriggling into the night air, she swung around to smile at the witches. Wish me luck. You won't need it, Gretchen called. The door swung shut, and Nora took up her seat at the head of the table, and fetched a slice of ham from the basket. Truth be told, if she were here any longer, she would have eaten every scrap. Gretchen's belly gurgled in appreciation, and she settled beside her companion to make a hasty meal of what remained. She'd wager that Jürgen had made off with the best bits, but she couldn't blame the troll from scarpering in the face of girl problems. Although new to human society, he'd picked up the basics of etiquette pretty quickly. What a day, Nora sighed. So where do we find the Baron, so I can confess to my crimes? Gretchen chewed on a hunk of bread. Nora swung around to peer at the window, which had darkened since they'd arrived. His lordship would be busy by now, too far into his cups to remember anything come morning anyhow. You could lock me in the dungeon overnight, and haul me into his presence when he wakes from his stupor? Gretchen snickered as she took a sip of brandy. She also wagered Jürgen sorely regretted not taking the cask with him. I've got a better idea. Nora leaned back on her seat with mischief on her face. Why don't we find a nice vantage to watch these preening peacocks and maybe give young Missy a helping hand? You don't think she can manage it herself? That ogre has been peddling her wares around these parts for weeks now. Heard the Baron's wife herself talking about these clay pools. Says she's setting up a demonstration in the fountain tonight. The gentry are like bower birds, always on the lookout for the next shiny thing. And the tallest tower's are old hat, I suppose? Gretchen ran a tongue over her teeth and stood. What kind of mischief were you thinking? You'll see. Nora chortled and heaved herself off the chair to collect a small box from a shelf underneath her crystals. The witches made their way through the courtyard and collected Jürgen on the way. His eyes lit up at the sight of the cask under Gretchen's arm and they climbed a set of stairs on the outer walls of the house. Nora produced a key from her belt, slipped it into the door at the top, and they strolled onto the roof, admiring the clean open air with the stars shining down. This way. Nora scuttled toward the front of the house, where the sounds of merriment accompanied torchlight. Peering over the edge, they saw people spilling from inside, either squawking with laughter or sitting quietly further into the tightly clipped gardens, sharing close whispers. In the middle was the large fountain the estate boasted, its water glimmering in the moody lighting. Nora dusted off the wooden box with her sleeve, and Gretchen snatched it out of her grasp. Now what do we have here? She squinted down at the faded lettering. Nora Brightstar! Bog in a box? What's a witch like you doing with something like this? I played my fair share of pranks in my younger years, she grinned. This was one of my favourites. Just add water and you've got yourself an instant swamp. 
that thing better not turn up at my tavern. Jurgen picked at his teeth with a frown. Or I'll know who to blame. Nora's cheeks coloured and she gave a dismissive wave. Now, just the matter of getting it in the fountain. You sure this is a good idea? I mean, I hate to be the voice of reason, but won't you be in all kinds of trouble with the Baron? Gretchen puffed out her cheeks. Oh no, dear. Nora turned her grandmotherly smile to Gretchen. It's you that will take the rap for this. Gretchen's eyes boggled and her mouth worked, but all that came out was an undignified squeak. I meant it when I said you owed me. There was a glint in Nora's eye. And after using my only sunstone for no good reason, I figure that's double. Besides, don't you want to help the girl? Gretchen's eyes flickered to the courtyard where Rapunzel had emerged to chatter among the crowd. She was certainly drawing eyes, and Gretchen couldn't imagine anyone scoffing at the towering beauty. She looked like one of her hotels, with the dress a shining silver to match the pictures of the pristine stone blocks. I suppose I owe the pair of you, Gretchen sighed, but the prospect of a vacation to the dungeon takes all the fun out of this. How are we going to get it down there? Jürgen plucked the box out of Gretchen's hand and drew his powerful arm back to toss it over the wall. Its lid opened in mid-air, and it landed in the fountain's base with a neat splash. Nobody seemed to notice, and it took a few seconds before the bubbles started. They watched with bated breath as the clear water turned an unpleasant shade of brown. The first sign of the smell came from below, when the partygoers sniffed at the air with revulsion painted on their faces. That thing is amazing, Gretchen gasped. If we ever get it out of the Baron's strong room, I'm calling first dibs. Ah, uh, Nora tapped her nose with a finger. If he blames you, then I'll handle the clean-up and hold it in my safe keeping. The first wafts of the putrid stench reached the roof, and they held sleeves to their noses. Below, people were fleeing inside or coming out to see what the commotion was about. Rapunzel stood pointing a finger at a solid form, although they could only see the back of the ogre. Let's get out of here! Jürgen's sleeve muffled his voice. With one last glance, Gretchen hurried after Jürgen and Nora, giggling despite the horrid smell which permeated every sense. Her eyes watered as she trod down the stone steps, and although she knew she was in a world of trouble come morning, she intended on making the most of what the night offered. Yoo-hoo! Anyone home? Gretchen bashed on Mildred's door, pointedly ignoring the spectacular garden surrounding her. Gretchen! Mildred appeared from around the side of her fancy brick house, holding a hand shovel and an uprooted leafy mass. You have some nerve turning up here. I can explain. Gretchen held her hands up. Just got out of the clink under the Baron's fancy house on the proviso I swing by. Mildred's eyebrows climbed her forehead. Pumpkin fraud hardly constituted jail time. Now... I have a copy for you, and I left one with the Baron. She fumbled in her pouch and drew out a scroll tied with string. A full confession, along with a solemn pledge that I will never enter another pumpkin growing competition again. Mildred pursed her lips and took the proffered scroll. After inspecting the tight script penned by the Baron's clerk, she took a deep breath and looked Gretchen in the eye. That wasn't the part that was unforgivable, you know. Her composure cracked and her lip trembled. To say those awful things about Esme's disappearance, I didn't deserve that. Guilt clawed at Gretchen's stomach, just as grief washed over her mind. Perhaps she had misplaced the blame, but if Mildred hadn't sent Aunt Esme on that goose chase, none of it would have happened. I just... Well, once I find out what really happened, you'll be the first to know. She pushed the gravel at her feet around with her boot. Aunt Esme always spoke highly of you. I considered her a dear friend. About the competition, Gretchen puffed out her cheeks. Nora had no idea that I'd tampered with the pumpkin. Divination is a bit hit and miss like that, and it wasn't a growing potion that interfered. Look, I know I'm in no position to ask favours, but this really wasn't her fault, and the competition means the world to her. I suppose, Mildred interjected, that if you're out of the game, there's no reason for Nora to be ousted. I'll expect an apology, of course, for throwing that muck at me. In writing. Gretchen's eyes bulged, but she plastered a polite smile on her face and nodded. There was no way Nora would agree to that, but Gretchen has seen her signature enough times to make a fair imitation. And if she got found out, well, 
she'd deal with that when it came. Thank you for joining me on this fantastical journey through Of Hair and No Hair, episode two of the Gretchen's Misadventures series. If you're hungry for more magical escapades, don't forget to subscribe to my channel for future readings and fantastical tales. Share your thoughts on this misadventure or recommend your favourite fantasy reads in the comments below. Your insights are the magic that keeps this community thriving. If you're ready for more of Gretchen and her witchy exploits, give this video a thumbs up and hit the notification bell to stay updated on all things audiobook. Until our next adventure, may your books be filled with wonder and your days with magic. Happy reading! <laughs>